Tonight, as cities in mourning after today's tragic school bus crash that took the lives of two young students and a teacher's aide. Plus, parents with heavy hearts reunited with their children. Our cameras were there as a mother pulls her daughter safely in her arms. That little girl has an eyewitness account to the crash. We're hearing from her coming up. Live from the station that's on your side, this is 6 News at 11. Good evening, everybody. I'm Gene Patterson. I'm Lori Tucker. Tonight, the community reeling after a school bus crash leaves three people dead and sends several others to the hospital. We have been following this story for you since we brought it to you as breaking news on 6 News at 4. The buses were from Chilhowee Intermediate and Sunnyview Primary School. A woman and two girls were killed. Our team coverage continues tonight. Both of our reporters, Cameron Taylor and Kayla Strayer, have been on the scene off Asheville Highway all afternoon. We begin with Cameron right now, who has the very latest on the investigation and Cameron, what answers have you found out? Well, Lori, I'm here on Asheville Highway right behind me. As you can see, it is still closed and isn't expected to reopen until at least midnight. Now, I've been here since around 3 o'clock getting more information as it continues to come in. The latest I'm hearing from the Knoxville Police Department is that the National Transportation Safety Board will be helping out with this investigation. Also, I'm learning that the Tennessee Highway Patrol will be doing an inspection on both buses. It's all to find out how this crash exactly happened, killing two children and one adult. And we just ask the community to uh, uh, pray uh, for for the loss of lives. An emotional day for all who have been trying to figure out how two Knox County school buses collided. Knoxville police investigators say a bus aide and two children in grades kindergarten through third grade died. It was a woman and two little girls. When something like this happens, it's, uh, it's tragic. Uh, it, it hurts and uh, it feels like we, you know, we've lost members of our Knox County Schools family and, and indeed we have. Several other people on board both buses were sent to the hospital for their injuries. A very preliminary investigation shows that a bus from Chilhowee Intermediate School was driving eastbound on Asheville Highway. Then suddenly it made a left turn going over the median and hitting another school bus from Sunnyview Primary School. All three people who died were on that bus. Now, other information I can tell you is that KPD is still in the process of notifying families about the deaths. They will also be conducting uh, tests for alcohol and drugs for both bus drivers. We're going to continue to follow this story as more develops live in East Knox County. Cameron Taylor, WATE, 6 on your side. All right, thank you, Cameron. Other passengers in those buses are recovering tonight. Uh, Knoxville police tell us two children and one adult were taken to UT Medical Center for treatment of multiple injuries. We just checked and all three are in stable condition right now. And Children's Hospital treating about 20 students from this accident. Their injuries ranging from cuts and scrapes and bruises. A spokesperson for the hospital telling us just before 8 o'clock tonight that all of those patients had been released. Well, today's tragedy hitting many families tonight, and we're hearing from a little girl who was on one of the school buses as it crashed. Continuing our team coverage, WATE 6 on your side reporter Kayla Strayer is live at the scene after witnessing some emotional reunions this afternoon, Kayla. Lori Jean, it has been such an emotional night out here. I was actually here earlier the moment when one of the families found out that their little girl would not be coming home with them tonight. It was all they could do to scream helplessly. Many people out here were brought to tears. But I do want to say also that I spoke with a woman who was waiting to hear news of her daughter and then finally was reunited. Just, just be calm and be patient with us. As I arrived near the scene of the school bus crash, police were telling parents to be calm and patient as they read a list of names of children who were safe. Tara Sampson and her youngest daughter hug each other as they wait for news of Tara's 10-year-old daughter, Abby, who was on one of the buses. It was very heart-wrenching. The phone call I got was, I hope I never get a phone call like that again in my life. 
we are talking, a bus full of kids pulls up. Oh, here they come. Oh, I'm so excited right now. Is that your daughter? Yeah, I believe so. I was there as Abby stepped off the bus into her mom's arms. Yours is okay. Oh, no. She's tough. It's okay. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're with her. Abby says she was on the bus that did not flip over. The bus driver is driving, and there is a car in front of us, and he was going fast, and the car had stopped. So the bus driver, like, turned around or something, and then there's a bus coming by, and then it hit the bus and then the other bus flip. Yeah. After this emotional day, the family heads home to start healing. The thinner was great. Just I was just waiting. That's all I wanted to do was see her. I'm just happy. Happy to have my girl home. Now we're going to go have some hot chocolate. Yeah. Now, I did speak with a counselor who was out here tonight. She tells me the families and the children are handling this very well, but of course she says to be very patient with them and offer them plenty of compassion as they do try to move forward from this tragedy. Live in East Knox County, Kayla Strayer, WHE 6 on your side. Oh, goodness. All right, thank you, Kayla. You know, when a tragedy like, like this strikes, how should parents talk to their children? It can be so difficult to do that, but it is something that it requires every parent's attention. Well, Jean turned to child psychologist Dr. Joshua Williams for some guidance for you. Well, joining us now is Dr. Joshua Williams, and uh, Doctor, thanks for joining us. Uh, it, this has been a very tragic and difficult day for a lot of people here in Knox County, and anybody watching, knowing that two small children have passed in this terrible, terrible accident, not to mention the adult. Uh, as parents watching, how do they explain these kinds of things to their children? It's a, a horrible moment in time, and um, parents are going to struggle with their own feelings first, and that's going to be very important for them to get some closure on it for themselves so they can present what's going on to their kids in a matter-of-fact and wholly reassuring fashion, mm -hmm. that we take a positive look or a view for the kids. We reassure them that things will be okay. And as parents and as educators, we try to keep things as normal as possible. Mm -hmm. And for those, for those parents whose children went to school with these kids, mm -hmm. that poses an even more difficult task, does it not? It, it does. Um, depending on the age of the children, of course, the younger children will be very preoccupied with their own safety, yeah. uh, less probably worried or focused on the loss itself. Uh, they're going to be very attuned to the reactions of parents around them and, and uh, authorities in their lives. I've heard some discussion that they're thinking of closing the schools. That's correct. I think that would probably be a mistake. The yeah. schools have uh, school psychologists who are trained for trauma response. Mm -hmm. um, there's a curriculum developed by the American Psychological Association and the National Association of School Psychologists for helping kids cope with this. And there are also curriculum, curricula rather, for teachers yeah. on how to cope with this stuff. And in as much as we were trying to show kids that life goes on, and that there's a, a normal world still there, as bizarre as this event has been. Yeah. Going back to school would be very important. Yeah, because I, I guess it would put too much emphasis on the fact that there is a loss, and they've now you've now taken these children out of their routine. It, it creates another emotional uh, scenario where yeah. there's already a, a horrific one, and so our job now is to reassure kids that life goes on, not yeah. that we just stop everything and that life will never be the same. Is, is this maybe as much for the, the adults who have to go to that school? Because they lost a teacher's aide, yeah. and they've lost children. They, I mean, I, I would have a difficult time teaching kids the next day as if nothing had happened. Or, or well, I don't think you do it as if nothing happens, sure. but, but you do, again, seek that reassuring tone. You, 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 there are times for the adults to mourn we have funerals, we can have groups for the adults and so on, but their job now is to protect their children and the way they do that is to do reassuring things. The, the, the smaller children will resonate to the emotional reactions of the adults. If we have adults crying and tearing their clothing and, and you know, in different ways people mourn, right. that's very upsetting the children. Right. Whereas if, if the child says something happened to my friend, the parent says, yes, a terrible thing happened to your friend. And the child says, well, will I be safe? Will things be all right? That's an opportunity for the teacher, for the clergy, for the doctor, for the nurse, for the parent to say, yes, we're going to make sure we're all as safe as we can be. Great. All right. Dr. Josh Williams, always good to talk with you. My pleasure. All right.
All right, now having just heard what the doctor advised, well, Knox County Schools has decided, though, to cancel classes tomorrow at Sunnyview Primary and Chilhowee Intermediate Schools. But for those who need it, counselors will be there at those schools from 10 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon. If parents are concerned about this, we're told teachers and principals will be extra sensitive to students' needs. Now, we spoke with the head of the crisis response team for Knox County Schools, who says they have a support team for these children. If you see a child that's struggling, that's exhibiting different behavior um, symptoms, if parents see that at home they're having difficulties, they need to contact their principal, and the principal knows how to reach out for help from the counselors, the psychologists, and the social workers. The Knox County Schools tell us that those counselors will work with students on a case-by-case -case basis as long as they are needed. You know, this tragedy also sparking a lot of conversation on social media. Some are pushing for safety changes when it comes to our school buses. A Knox County student, just eight years of age, deciding to write a letter. His mother posted it on Twitter. We want to read some of that to you. It says, quote, Dear government, buses have been crashing a lot. Some children have been going to the hospital and some have been dying. Now, you might think that buses are big and strong and can't crash, but they can. Then he says, can we start putting seat belts in? He says, if you guys say no, it might not be that wise. I think you should say yes. Kids live, lives are in danger. Thank you for reading this. Thank you. It is signed Anderson Jones, age eight. Now we looked into Anderson. He's a student at Bricky McLeod Elementary and we visited with Anderson tonight. You see him there holding his letter. We asked him about the letter and why he felt moved to write it. And he tells us that he rides the bus to school and he wants everyone to be safe. Well, I was kind of interested. Why did the um, why did the bus driver wear a seatbelt when we couldn't? Because if the bus got in a crash, he would be fine. We wouldn't. And I just got kind of nervous about that. Anderson asked his mom to help him send the letter to Dr. Jim McIntyre, the superintendent, and even to some political leaders. I think he did a very good job writing that letter and sending it out to and everybody. Very, and very well spoken. Yes, he's getting a lot of attention. All right, the community is hosting a vigil tomorrow to remember the victims and their families. It will be held at the Church Street United Methodist Church. That's at 900 Henley Street in Knoxville. The public is invited to attend. Now we want to wrap up this information for you. A Knox County school bus crashing into another bus today, causing it to flip. It happened just off of Asheville Highway about 3 p.m. Buses are from Chilhowee Intermediate and Sunnyview Primary Schools. Those schools are closed tomorrow. Now, as we reported, three people were killed. A woman described as a teacher's aide and two girls, two little girls, young students. The investigation still underway tonight. We hope to get more answers tomorrow. Now, we're going to stay with this story for you, getting answers to this investigation. We'll have the very latest on Good Morning Tennessee beginning at 4.30 a.m. and, of course, on our website, wate.com. All right, still to come here on 6 News, a good Samaritan pulls over to help a woman in distress. But the woman was not at all what she seemed. How that victim got back at the suspects. Coming up. And we have a band of steady showers right over downtown Knoxville, right over Knox County, moving off to the northeast. A little drier air in the forecast. I'll have details coming up. Plus, the unrest in Ferguson felt here in East Tennessee as local students block a traffic area. Hear their message coming up next. You're watching WATE 6 News at 11. A group of University of Tennessee students blocking traffic this afternoon in an effort to protest the Ferguson decision. A lot of students out there and some frustrated drivers were not very happy to see them. Hear all those car horns as students hold up their hands in protest. This demonstration follows after a grand jury chose not to indict Officer Darren Wilson in the death of teenager Michael Brown. The students marched onto 16th Street and Cumberland Avenue. The protesters say they picked the intersection for a reason. Just because you may not be a, co a person of color or a black person when you walk out of your house in the, in the morning, you don't have to face these things. Well, guess what? When we block this intersection, yes, you do. 
This demonstration lasted about 45 minutes. Now, there were no arrests during the time. A truck did strike a KPD cadet who was on his bike directing traffic. That cadet, we're told, received numerous cuts and abrasions, but he was transported to UT Medical Center for treatment. A Hawkins County Cemetery is now under state control. We've been following this story for you here on 6 News. During a hearing in Nashville today, a Department of Commerce and Insurance Commissioner was appointed as the receiver of the Hawkins County Memorial Gardens. The move gives her full control of the cemetery, its property, and its staff. This investigation comes after complaints from families that they weren't getting the headstones they paid for. The cemetery's previous owner, you see her there, Vicki Ringley, is accused of bad business. Ringley has been under criminal investigation in Hawkins County for several months. Well, tonight, two men are facing charges for theft. Sevier County deputies say they are responsible for stealing some from some local storage units. The Sheriff's Office posting this photo on Facebook this afternoon. Investigators say the two were seen driving a U-Haul van, and within about three hours, deputies posted that the two men had been taken into custody. No word yet tonight on their identities, but we will keep you updated as we learn more. In Nashville, a good Samaritan tricked by a couple who robbed him turned the tables on them. The victim is a truck driver from New Jersey. He says he was approached by a woman who asked him for a dollar, but he later found out that woman was a decoy. Police say Lionel Richardson jumped out of a nearby pickup. They say he grabbed a metal pipe and demanded the driver's money. The victim, though, was able to take cell phone pictures of the suspect before he took off and gave that info to investigators. Richardson was later arrested. Well, tonight, some of the most beautiful properties in Knoxville and Knox County recognized for setting the standard at Keep Knoxville Beautiful's annual Orchid Awards at the Foundry. These awards have been presented to outstanding commercial sites in our area since 1979. There were several winners tonight in different categories, and we're happy to say the WATE 6 on Your Side received the Evergreen Award for our continued efforts to maintain the integrity of Greystone Mansion, the home of WATE. I was honored to accept the award tonight along with our general manager, Dean Littleton. And we do have a beautiful home here at Greystone mm -hmm. uh, that's been the home to Channel 6 for a long time. And, mm -hmm. and with all the renovations, we'll continue to be. Yes. That's right. Historic Register, proud of that as well. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, some showers coming across to water our plants out fried and front, mm -hmm. keep them nice and fresh and clean. We look at this situation where the showers are moving through Knox County, weakening, but some of the communities that may hear some of the uh, a little bit heavier downpours are listed there at the right side of your screen. Uh, could be into Friends Station about 1127 into the Alpha community up toward Morristown, 11. 53 toward midnight toward Morristown. So this is all moving from southwest to northeast. And there's not a whole lot of activity left. Still some scattered light showers, but I think uh, you'll see these on and off tonight. And maybe the first part of the day tomorrow before we start to see improvements. Temperatures really steady. I mean, we've been in the same territory all day long from the mid 50s to the um, low 50s this evening. 49 in Whitley City, 59 over in Harlan County. It's 57 in Morristown and Knoxville. 56 in Townsend, southwest breezes, clouds, not much change in the air mass, and so not much change in our temperatures either. It'll be damp overnight, whether it's raining or drizzle or fog, it just it will feel damp even if it's not raining. Limited rain tomorrow, and the mild air does hang with us over the next several days. There's that wedge of warmer air, just easy to pick out on southwest breezes all the way up into southeast Kentucky, well above average. Cold air is on the right side or the east side of the mountains. We talked about this cold air damming coming out on the east side of the mountains and on 4 o'clock broadcast earlier today and low 30s back to the west. But none of that cold air is going to come our direction. It's going to get pushed back to the north, and so we're going to keep it pretty mild. There you are, your hour-by-hour -hour forecast, 50 at 7 o'clock, 55 by noon, and near 60 late in the day. Those terrain chances about 20%. Most of you aren't going to have to deal with that most of the day. Here it is overnight into early tomorrow morning. This is what I'm talking about, the first part of the day tomorrow. Notice the timeline moves into early by sunrise, 4 o'clock. Uh, not sunrise at 4 o'clock, but early risers at 4 o'clock. Then sunrise, just a bit after 7 o'clock, you see that diminish through the noon hour and into the afternoon. And lo and behold, there might even be some breaks in the clouds. That'd be nice. That'll warm us up. Keep us in the 50s tomorrow. Some may touch the 60 degree mark, but notice as the youngsters head home from school, breaks in the clouds are expected. So the power planter takes us up to 62 by late tomorrow afternoon. Should be dry by then and will be mostly cloudy. So the temperature's not falling all that much as we look at the next several days. And next several days tomorrow, starting a pretty mild pattern that continues all the way into Thursday and Friday. So there you are, 62 on Wednesday, Thursday 58. Took the rain out of Thursday. I will tell you there's about a 10% chance of picking up a shower Thursday. Then clouds are going to gradually increase.
increase as our next area of low pressure develops and comes our way Friday. So late Friday into Saturday looks like the next best chance for rain, at least a, a, anything significant. 57 is the forecast high. Then Sunday looks dry and there's going to be a slight chance for shower coming our way Monday. A couple things to notice over the next seven days. First of all, we're in early December. Those overnight lows are nowhere near the freezing mark and usually we're close to freezing this time of the year so we don't have any winter precipitation. Daytime highs are several degrees above normal through Friday and then near normal for the weekend. And there's a hint about 10 to 15 days down the road that we could see some colder air coming our way. And that would get us a little bit closer to Christmas. We'll keep you posted on that one. Thank you, Matt. Well, UT football program with a possible financial windfall today, even in the face of some bad news. Yeah, Prentice joins us now with more on that. Yeah, Tennessee could stand to gain nearly a million dollars with the news out of UAB today, but they've still got to find a team to play starting next season. More on that next in sports. The Tennessee football team has played UAB four times and won each matchup, the last one back in 2010. That game, it appears, will stand as the final one between the Vols and Blazers. Today, the University of Alabama Birmingham announcing they're shutting down the football program, meaning Tennessee needs a new opponent to begin the 2015 season. The Vols were scheduled to take on the Blazers at LP Field in Nashville. Tennessee Athletics Director Dave Hart issuing this statement today through a spokesperson, quote, we're working with the SEC and Scott Ramsey in Nashville, Ramsey, the president of the Nashville Sports Council, to secure a replacement for UAB to open our season in 2015. When we have a formal resolution, we will make an announcement. Now, according to the contract with Tennessee, UAB will owe UT $925,000 for breaking that contract to play next season. The website, footballscoop.com, is reporting Butch Jones has already been approached about the Michigan vacancy and already turned down the Wolverines. Brady Hoke wasn't let go as Michigan's head coach until this afternoon. Jones is a Michigan native and was head coach for a time at Central Michigan. Carson Newman's football season's over, but they may be still in line for some big awards, including the Harlan Hill Trophy. That's the D2 equivalent of the Heisman. Running back and former Gibbs High School star Andy Hibbett has been named a finalist for that honor. He rushed for more than 1,300 yards this season with 18 total touchdowns. The winner of the Harlan Hill Trophy will be announced December 19th. The winner of the 3A state title game will be announced much sooner, like Friday. And it could be the same as last season. That's because the Alcoa Tornadoes faced this team in this exact situation one year ago. That's when Alcoa beat Christ Presbyterian Academy 25-7 in the 2013 3A state title game. Now the rematch. Once again, CPA is undefeated. And once again, Alcoa has one loss. That coming to Maryville. CPA looking for revenge while Alcoa is looking for a repeat and the Tornadoes are not expecting any surprises. No, I don't think they've changed a lot, but we hadn't either. I mean, yeah. good programs don't change a whole lot. You know, you can go back and look, and it's about looking at, like, the team that we saw last year, and I'm sure they're saying the th same thing about us. But you look at the good programs around, Maryville, Webb, Alcoa, Innsworth, those kind of teams, you know, you see the same thing year in, year out. I have a lot of friends that are older than me and have played here. Toss and I like to talk to them, and they kind of make fun of me for only having one ring. Some of them have four. It'd be great to be able to say I've got two. The Tornadoes changed classification but have still won eight of the last ten state championships, including a run of seven in a row from 2004 to 2010. Tennessee Titans have placed wide receiver and former Vol Justin Hunter on injured reserve, effectively ending his season after that hit. He's still in a Houston hospital recovering from a lacerated spleen. Hunter writing on Twitter, he couldn't wait to get back to his own bed a few hours before the Titans announced the roster move today. He was hurt Sunday when Texans safety Daniel Manning hit him in the first quarter on a pass that was intercepted against the Texans. Hunter returned only to be taken to the hospital later after complaining of stomach pains during the 45 to 21 loss. Our best to him as he faces a recovery from a very serious injury. That is it for sports. We'll be back after this. Working on your Christmas list, I bet. Here are a few free apps to make it easier. All right, first up, uh, Coupon Sherpa. It rounds up hundreds of coupons from retailers so you can download it in the store. Uh, shoppers looking to compare prices on the go can use apps like Price Grabber, too. Yeah, Red Laser works in a similar fashion, searches for retailer discounts and coupons as well. And if you need help organizing your list, try an app like Santa's Bag, which lets shoppers keep track of what they are buying and, most importantly, keep track of all 
of your budget. Yeah, but is that password protected? Because I know people in my family who would look in Santa's bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear that. Well, <laughs> these are apt to get the rain out of here. There's going to have showers, some more developing back to the west, but we'll see them decrease during the day tomorrow. All right. Thanks so much for joining us. See you back here tomorrow. Stay connected with WATE 6 on Facebook and Twitter. Let us know what stories we can cover from your neighborhood. Thanks for watching. WATE 6, the station that's on your side.